I was yeah. like, you know, I, I, 20 years from now, I'd like people to, to be in a bookstore and see, oh, what is this? You know, what, what, this weird looking helicopter. Yeah, you know, it, it's one of my biggest regrets that I did not keep good notes, that I didn't yeah. keep more souvenirs, take more photos, um, you know, and just keep hold of stuff throughout not only my career, but just the deployments and bring stuff back. And, you know, we sit around a campfire and drink beer, drink scotch and, you know, tell old war stories. And truly they can be very funny. Um, sometimes there's a, a bit of <laughs> dry and, and dark humor aspect to them, but yeah. uh, I think people really enjoy that kind of stuff. And yeah, I'm kicking myself that I didn't do a better job um, of capturing that stuff yeah uh, but you know honestly on your by the time you're on your second or third deployment it's kind of just like okay you know i've been here before seen this before like there's nothing new you just kind of yeah you just kind of get up in the morning go fly your mission go to sleep and wash rinse and repeat 365 times and go home uh, roger and then that was a uh, quite a bit of fire there. It's Memorial Day weekend, 2020, and my friend Burnus and I decided to have a discussion about the Kiowa Warrior, both as a pending release DCS module from Polychop Simulation, but also to share the history of this feisty little aircraft. Enjoy. All right, so yeah, we'll just go ahead and get started. So uh, okay. You know, I appreciate it. it. Literally, tens of people will probably see this, but you know, <laughs> nevertheless, we'll uh, <laughs> we'll soldier on. Um, hey, it's my my first time. Yeah, well, no, because you're you're like an internet internet uh, sensation now. You've got that one uh, video with the uh, switchology. Three now. Oh, three! I didn't even know that. Yeah, yeah. And what was it Each like? Each one. Close to an hour, so I just posted the other one uh, yesterday or the day before yesterday. But yeah, people seem to like them. Yeah, I was gonna say, what was it like, like a thousand They're... views in an hour? So I don't know, it was some crazy number that you were amazed by. Nothing that I expected at all. It's I think it's up to ten thousand across all three in about a week. So I I was like you said, I was expecting dozens. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, a high dozen. Yeah, well, and it kind of goes back to to what I was kind of mentioned it before like i think there's a a thirst for this you know knowledge um and, and that's why I, th I think this would be an interesting conversation just based on two guys who kind of know a little bit you know I, I know a little bit less than you but about the kiowa um it, to, to speak to authenticity just for credibility you know background i flew the kiowa from i want to say 2004 to 2011 i think is when i left bragg and then you know it, it went away and i wasn't able to fly it anymore and i went 64s but then for you when when did you start flying yeah so i enlisted in the army as a uh-60 maintainer so a 67 tango back in those days now 15 tango but that was in 94 uh, after I got out of college, um, I went to work in cubicle land for Dell computers. I did that for about six months and decided <laughs> I, I poked my head up above the cubicle walls one day and said, I can't do this for the rest of my life. So uh, enlisted, um, that was the mid nineties. So, you know, kind of the, the middle of the, or the, the height of the Clinton army after desert one drawdown, um, everything. Times were sparse, but never let, so I needed a job. So I went ahead and enlisted with the intent of going warrant um, after I could, you know, get my foot in the door as a, as a crew chief. So did that for two and a half years. Also at Fort Bragg, so I went airborne um, and then got stationed at Fort Bragg with uh, 2nd Battalion, 82nd Aviation in those days. Uh, did that for two and a half years. And then in that time, I put in my warrant packet. Uh, so eventually got accepted, and so I went to flight school in December of 96, and then uh, that takes about, you know, 15, 16 months and finished um, the AQC, the Advanced Aircraft Qualification for the 58 in those days, in uh, June of 98, and then went to Fort Drum as my first duty assignment. Okay. And just like you, um, flew it through, oh, when was that, 2014 is when the draw the ARI the aviation restructure initiative which divested the 58 started happening so over a two-year period they started drawing down so I think I had my last flight was in December of 15 when we flew 
uh, a bunch of them from Fort Rucker to Arizona cross country to put him in the boneyard and put him mm. to sleep. Hmm. That's a long flight. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of bittersweet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I was working basically an office job when when the ARI went off, and uh, I was lucky because uh, you know someone I knew was flying them to Fort Hood to get repainted as we were selling them and uh happened to find out about it and he's like hey do you want to go for a flight so i was uh, that was you know like you said it was bittersweet just that last chance some closure if you will in a relationship um yeah um well so flying over the boneyard in arizona was number one it was awe-inspiring to see hmm. literally square miles of aviation history laid out uh almost as far as the eye could see you got c5s b-29s um things that you've never even heard of just parked out there by the rows an awe-inspiring sight and they're just out there you know sitting yeah and then everything else is out there and then you know then you look down and somewhere in that mix are you know 20 other kws that have already been dropped off and yeah you can't even see them yeah yeah, no, that's insane. I've I've always wanted to see that. I've seen you know pictures, but I I can imagine that pictures do nothing for that. Either. No, no. So speak serendipity. Um, just kind of going back on the history. Like when I went to flight school, having come out of uh, being a maintainer on UH sixty Blackhawks, I was convinced that I wanted to be a a Blackhawk pilot. Hmm. And um, my grades uh, throughout flight school allowed me to select Blackhawks. But then, you know, as things happen, I had to give up my Blackhawk slot to this uh, guy that had, we call it an exceptional family member program. So they kind of take precedence over your selection when you're selecting aircraft. And looking back, that was the best thing that could have ever happened to me because personality wise, and as you know, you know, there's a certain personality that goes with the culture mm -hmm. um, in the cavalry and in the assault world and the cargo world, et cetera. Yeah. Super fun. Yeah. Looking back, I wouldn't have had, I, I count myself blessed that I was able to fly KWs for, you know, 15 years. So, yeah. No, I, you know, when I went into flight school, having been an armor guy, I wanted Apaches. You know, it was just a flying tank. That's all I wanted to do. And, but I was drawn to the culture, you know, and that was really the deciding point for me was which culture did I like more from what I had learned. And, and going 58, I mean, absolutely answered that call. And, and then I lucked out, you know, between ARI and then I got to go fly Apache. So it was a little bit of best of both worlds. So Yeah, so I didn't know the first thing about the cavalry culture. Hmm. Um, so coming from the armor world, were you uh, ground cav or were you straight up armor battalion? So my very first job uh, was a tank platoon leader in a cavalry troop. So we had two tank okay. platoons and two scout platoons of Bradleys. And that's just, that was my initial, you know, welcome to the army type, type job. But I yeah, just so love that Yeah, so you had some mentality. exposure. Yeah. You had some exposure to the KW through that though. You, 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 well, I had exposure. To my, the very first time I saw a Kiowa, I had no idea what they were. I was at Fort Stewart walking around. We, we had an assembly area set up. We just got done doing some training and I was walking from, I, I guess, the, the troop CP back to where my platoon was, something. And there was this, this big dirt berm off, I don't know, five, 600 meters away. And I remember just like looking over and I see this weird thing sticking up over the top, this little ball. And it's just kind of like floating there. And I'm like, what, what is that? And then suddenly this helicopter just pops up from behind this berm and I, it, you know, and I'd never seen this thing before and it just zooms off over me. And, and I know nice. now that this guy was basically just watching us, you know, goofing around yeah. or whatever, but, and it was just, it was just incredible. Like what, what the hell was that? You know? <laughs> um, and then later we, a couple of days later we were driving the tanks back after all of our training and I looked back behind me and there was another one of these helicopters and he was like following us. And I know now he's probably practicing on us, you know I mean? He was, he yeah. was lining up for shots, but at the time I had no idea what he was doing. Um, so that's really the only exposure I had from an air cav standpoint, but I knew that I just liked the cavalry, you know, I liked the mission and, right. and, and you hear that in flight school all the time is, you know, pick the mission, not the aircraft. Um, and, and yeah, that's what I tell, that's what I tell people now is, yeah. you know, you're going to be flying a big multi-million dollar, big green machine. Um, go with what your personality is, not necessarily what you, 
what you think you might know about what the coolest aircraft is or whatever. Yeah. They're all super capable. They're all super complex. Um, and now really in the U S army anyway, there's only three choices. So right. you, you don't have a lot of directions you can go. Um, but yeah, it, I, I kind of tell people like, you know, are you, are you wanting to shoot stuff and kind of have an open-ended mission or do you like, um, you know, planning and doing air assaults or, uh, when, when you're a young guy going through flight school, you really don't know what you want. So that that's always a tough one because it's going to be what you're doing yeah <laughs> uh for the next you know conceivably 15 years <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely so. you better enjoy it so with that kind of want to talk about this particular module for for dcs are you a big dcs player no okay um i've messed around with it and particularly through you know this venture of mm. working with polychop um certainly i've been um more engaged with it uh I was uh, so exposing myself to some ridicule here, but I was a big <laughs> Warcrafter for a long time. Uh oh. Um, and then you know, kind of just grew out of that and was sure. searching around for some other stuff to do. Uh, I was a big flight simmer throughout college, so in the '90s, you know, Microsoft Flight Simulator. I remember my first one was uh, the wireframe. You had like four wires that was supposed to be an airplane an airplane <laughs> um so started all the way back then but uh dcs you know that's it's a steep learning curve so oh, you yeah. got to be dedicated and uh really enthusiastic about it yeah. um so i have not as yet like joined a squadron or anything like that i mess around and in testing i, I get into the game and fly uh the kw but i have not as yet really been a an, an avid dcs simmer sure i think once the kw is released that's going to change yeah uh <laughs> yeah but uh up to this point no well the learning curve won't be as, as high either <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> you know another thing that you really didn't mention you, i mean you're an instructor pilot you you were a standardization pilot so the different levels there may maybe a little bit of back backstory to kind of explain sure. um your your pic well you get out of flight school and you're what you call what we call a PI or just a pilot. And you do that for two, three years and you kind of, you know, learn your chops, learn the job. And then as you become more proficient, you are basically given an evaluation and then um, you become a pilot in command, which uh, I guess would be sort of commensurate with being the captain of a, mm -hmm. of a civilian airplane or uh, airliner. Yeah. Um, from there, you can branch off into the maintenance realm or the safety realm or the uh, tactics realm or standardization instructing. So that's the route I took. And then you move up through company level, well, really platoon level within the company, mm -hmm. then company level, then squadron, which uh, I became a squadron SP. And then I went... Um, towards acquisitions. So that was after numerous deployments and I was kind of ready to step away from okay. from deploying every other year. Um, and then I went towards the acquisition side and I was uh, on the OH-58 Fox fielding team hmm. um, and arrived to Tickham Recon Attack, uh, which is the capability manager or the program manager for 58 Fox, which was supposed to be the successor for the 58D. Uh, six months before the program was canceled. <laughs> so, so g great timing. Um, but uh, so the path would have been um, going to brigade standardization, et cetera. But I skipped brigade and I went to um, a theater army standardization, <laughs> uh, which is kind of echelons above reality. Uh, and does, you don't do any fly in there really. And uh, now I'm back at Fort Rucker in uh, kind of a mentorship role uh working with the flight school students um in the training brigade at fort rucker so come full circle you know everybody ends up at fort rucker again um that's kind of a long-winded way of saying uh yeah spent the predominance of my time in the instructing realm then kind of got out of it and went towards the acquisition side so wow. uh skipped sort of that that intermediate level of uh, brigade time and went straight to division and theater army, which 
that's kind of in the weeds as far as what the jobs are, but sure, no, but no. there it is. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, when you finally look for a squadron to fly with on DCS, I'm sure you'll, you'll have a few <laughs> guys, you know, a few job offers based on experience, but yeah. And, and, and your videos too, you know, it, it kind of lends itself to here's an instructor. He's showing you how, how things work. Um, in fact, I think you've given me a few check rides if I remember correctly. Yeah, I think so. Probably. Um, yeah, one, once or twice. <laughs> Annual I, proficiency eval. Yeah, I think I think you gave me a PC ride, but I can't remember. You know, again, talking about the project, um, and I do want to talk about how you kind of got involved in this, sucked into this uh, with Polyshop. But again, it just goes back to the authenticity, and that's what it, that's what I'm drawn to, and, and what I'm interested in. What I want people to take away from this as well is that there really is a lot of community involvement, because you know, for us, this is a part of our life. I mean, like you said, 15 years flying it, you know, nine or 10 years for me flying it. You know, hell, I think we both got shot flying. You know, yeah. in Kiowa, right? Um, yeah, we're both recipients of the Forgot to Duck Award. Yeah, in fact, in fact, I think one of the first times we met, uh, there was a quick conversation where you you asked me what I drove, and it turns out we both drove an Isuzu Trooper. Um, yeah. And they were both, I think they were both white, and we both had purple heart plates. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Small world. Yeah, yeah. but. But that kind of goes back to, you know, why why do these guys care if they're not getting paid? Well, because this is a part of our life and we're sharing it and, and it's it's exciting to, to be a part of that. That's really what I've found through just the, the last week of releasing these videos is I, I was honestly surprised at the amount of interest that right. people seem to have. Um, so, you know, I kind of went real deep in the weeds, not really knowing what I was getting into on the first video I did and just kind of explaining like what's what in the cockpit. Yeah. Um, kind of figuring that, hey, most people don't know what smoke grenades are used for or how do we use the M4, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, then I wanted to give just a, like a, I guess a kind of a over detailed explanation of everything for those that are interested. And that, that seemed to garner so much interest that I guess I'll be doing like four or five or six more of these things, um, you know, working my way slowly through right. the checklist and it kind of explaining in detail what what each thing does i mean i i pulled out my old checklist just to kind of look through it you know and and kind of remember and, and i remember the first time i got into the the module and and i said i wonder if i can remember how to start this from memory and just went through all the checks you know just in my head and then looked at the books like oh yeah i'm right okay it started yeah uh, <laughs> well you know i tell you the the best way to learn something is to try to teach it so oh, yeah. i in, in going back through this and talking through these videos, uh, number one, I'm, you know, I've forgotten so much yeah. uh, that I have to go back and kind of riffle through my manuals and stuff and kind of refresh my, my memory. So much, so much of it is muscle memory and like you, your eyes just kind of the, we call it the, the mind body connection, right? D the more times you do something, your, your muscles just kind of know where to go. Your hands, like, I don't even have to look up. If I was sitting in the cockpit, I know where the where the anti collision light is and where the uh, IR jammer switch is. Right. I don't even have to look; my hand just knows where it is. And without that, without those physical references there, it's actually quite difficult to remember. Like, oh, was it this button or this button? So yeah. I find myself kind of stumbling sometimes, um, just for, going purely from memory, trying to replicate, you know, what was second nature ten years ago. Yeah, no. It, it's weird. No, absolutely. So how, and I've never asked you this before, so I'm, I'm honestly interested. How, how did you even get involved in this? So you're a guy that doesn't really play DCS. You're not really playing flight simulators. How did you suddenly become involved with, with Polychop? It was about two years ago. And, you know, you and I were both part of a, a 58D forum on Facebook, right? Mm -hmm. And I believe it was through that um a couple of the guys on PC or, or lurkers on there, so to speak. And he was posting uh, some screen grabs of the texture work and the wireframe development that he was doing and kind of just said, Hey guys, you know, just putting this out there. Um, we're working on this project and uh, this is what it looks like so far. And it was just pictures of the wireframe development of the, of the airframe at the time. And, you know, that just like, wow, that's really cool. Somebody is 
whatever, going to build a model or, you know, I didn't really know what it was about. So okay. I just kind of, I think I instant messaged him or private messaged him. Come to find out he already had a couple other guys that were 58, uh, former 58 guys that were advising, et cetera. Uh, and through that, just kind of started talking more and more and got involved with the, with the project and, uh, yeah, here we are today. Uh, so the the primary guy that started it off is was a a I'll I'll say a younger fifty eight guy, but he's now transitioned to to forty sevens, uh, and he's actually deployed right now. So hasn't been able to be involved in the project uh, for the last uh, twelve months, I think, because he's over mm-hmm. over in Afghanistan. So uh, with his departure, I kind of took up the reins a little bit as far as the advising role. Sure. Yeah, there's, there's uh, well, I was gonna say like six or seven people it seems in the group. Yeah, and you know, you know, three or four of them. Mm-hmm. Um, the maintain. So I've always reached out when I whenever I'm stumped with like some technical issue that I can't answer. There's a former TI or or technical inspector who's a maintainer, a senior maintainer on the team who has literally squirreled away, you know, two decades worth of manuals that <laughs> when I when I come up with some bizarre off the wall, like what does this circuit breaker do question, he can go to the manuals and and look it up and say, oh yeah, this is the one, you know, this wire diagram ends up here, et cetera. So uh, that, that's a great resource to have. And then uh, there's a maintenance test pilot on the team. There's two, uh, two or three Peter pilots. Mm-hmm. Uh, so just, and then, you know, I, I believe I recruited you into the team as well. So it's just that networking aspect. And, and it's great. I mean, the, the discussions and the, 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 you know, the conversations that we have and, and Sven actually like really pays attention and listens and, and, and cares, you know, he cares a lot about what the community says, um, which is, again, oh, yeah. just struck me that he cares so much about the, the authenticity of the aircraft, that it sounds right, that it looks right, that the, the feel of, of everything about it is right. Um, and that's one of the things that I, I wanted to talk about was if you jump in any DCS module or any flight simulator, you know, it, I, I say this tongue in cheek, that it's easy to create something like that. Of course it's not, but it's easy to just build like this as the cockpit of an F-15 or of, of whatever. But when you get into the module for the Kiowa like I feel like there's a lot of extra we'll call it love put into it I mean the way that it looks it, it is authentic feeling to me I, yeah I agree um and I think so we've all provided photos you know for to give a little clue on on you know the weathering and what they felt and smelled like so to speak hmm. um down to the water bottles on the dashboard like where the m4s are stowed and all that kind of stuff <laughs> where we threw our checklists up on the dash i mean he's done all that kind of stuff but the bottom line is yeah he solicits as far as the technical input and particularly on the flight model um there's just been i don't know how many man hours involved i i think you know hundreds on his part it it's quite astounding what goes into it and the other part of the pc team uh the the that's doing the development of the aerodynamic model i think are really challenged because Mm. now again i'm no i'm no dcs expert but you know it was built for modeling fixed wing and rotary wing is a completely different animal and you got to understand a whole new realm of aerodynamics and what's going on Mm. with air flows etc and i I don't think that the underlying code of DCS was sort of is very supportive of that. So there's been a lot of development work in making it feel right as well, which is a challenge, uh, especially when you know the PC guys live in Europe and we live here in the States, and there's an eight-hour time gap. And uh, whenever we're you know home from work and and logging in, they're at three in the morning, you know, wanting to go to sleep. So yeah. It's incredibly difficult, I can imagine, to try to replicate it because, you know, when you try to explain how does a helicopter fly to someone who's never flown or has certainly never flown a helicopter, it, it, you just something is lost in translation. You can't convey the the challenges, you know, that, that come with it. It is an unstable yeah. beast by its very nature. Yep, that's very true. And um, I know there's a lot of either former military pilots or current military pilots that are playing DCS. So, 
Um, and that's evident from like the questions that I've been fielding from the guys like, hey, have you talked about translating tendency or, right. you know, vortex ring state or this and that. So there is, there is a, in, in many cases, a baseline of knowledge that they're coming at it mm-hmm. um, with. It, it's a little odd, you know, sometimes you have to speak the language as, as if you're, you're translating it for somebody that doesn't even have a baseline that doesn't even speak a common language yeah. uh, in, in terms of the aerodynamics and whatnot. And then other other guys will field questions that are quite um, sophisticated and advanced. So sure. there, there's a wide spectrum of experience and interest. And um, they're, I think they're trying to address, well, they're trying to get the flight model as accurate as it possibly can be. Right. And yeah, there's just been a lot of work behind it. Yeah, and it's... It's incredibly hard to. Uh, I've never really flown a flight simulator for a helicopter that felt 100% right. Um, oh, me neither. You know, it's yeah. just there's always something that's a little off. But I tell you, the first time I picked up that 58 module and flew it, I remember f- the you know feeling quote unquote the shutter of of passing through ETL, and I was like, yep, uh, unbelievable. Like I've never seen that or experienced it, um, at, at least in anything that I've played. So just that little bit of care you know into something that's so small but was something that you know we we felt every time and thought about you know and, and looked for is indicative of the the level of effort that they're putting into the flight model yeah so i don't know if you ever had the opportunity to fly at the the two simulators that we had at fort rucker at warrior hall the 258 sims i think you were probably out of flight school by the time they were fielded yeah um that was oh five oh six time frame okay yeah, um so, so those are those are multi-million dollar devices. Hmm. Uh, they had, if I recall correctly, something like 53 separate computers running the f- various systems on those simulator devices. I mean, they were full motion, hydraulics, you know, the whole gamut. Um, and you hop in there and it still doesn't feel exactly like the helicopter. Sure. Like simulation will never get it just right and you've flown in the lct for the 64 as i have yeah um it's it's close but it's not the same yeah um so you know and those things are many millions of dollars yeah. so to to boil it down into something that runs off you know your i7 with an nvidia graphics card <laughs> is number one it's pretty amazing and two it's pretty damn close um, for the resources that are behind it. Yeah, flying a helicopter yeah. is a lot of, uh, you know, we talk about proprioceptive systems, you know, flying by a seat of your pants and stuff. I mean, you know, I fly fixed wing just, you know, recreationally. I don't, I don't know if you've done that as well, but, you know, it's just, a, it's just a very different feeling. It's a lot more mechanical flying a fixed wing than it is a helicopter. There's just so much like, I feel like this is about to happen, or I feel like this is currently happening with the aircraft and I need to yeah. correct, or I need to do something. Um, so yeah, it's incredibly hard to translate. And I tell you, there's a, there's a, I don't know if danger is the right word, but there's a point where, for instance, I've got, you know, I've logged, uh, something like 5,200 hours in the 58. Hmm. There's a point where it just becomes an extension of who you are. Yeah. And for me, that happened right around, uh, I don't know, 1,000, 1,200 hours where yeah. you're not even think about what, thinking about what's going on with the machine anymore. You just kind of know. Yeah. And that only increases uh, the more time you have in it. Now going back, and it trying to explain what you're feeling like you almost it, it's very difficult to translate it because like i was saying it's just it's just muscle memory and um the mechanics of it are almost lost it just becomes right magic <laughs> right <laughs> um, so it it you just kind of do it and your body just feels it and knows it and uh, but the great thing about being an instructor pilot is you have to figure out a way to translate what you know hmm into words and deeds that somebody that doesn't know can understand. Right. And so that's part of what, you know, a lot of talking and th- that's part of what I'm trying to do with these videos is just, you know, wear my voice out and over explaining stuff. Cause again, it, it seems like people are, are picking it up and they're interested in it and it, and it shows the level of thought and, and detail that we're trying to get behind this thing. Right. So one of the things that I, 
I don't know if concern is the right word, but but something I've certainly thought about. You know, Army helicopters, most military helicopters, multi-crew. I mean, that's how you operate it. I, I don't understand how K-50 pilots, you know, you know, do it in real life, doing that single pilot stuff yeah. in a helicopter. Um, obviously, they have a lot of systems helping them out. And, you know, Apaches, you could probably get away with it if you really had to. Um, as far as stability, you know, systems working for you and stuff, but, but a Kiowa, generally speaking, unstable, you know, and I, and I never really thought of it that way until I flew Apaches and realized, oh, this thing is pretty much flying itself right now. You yeah. know, I'm just kind of pointing it in the right direction, but you know, you're working a hundred percent of the time in a Kiowa. So now, you know, we've got a game where how do you, how do you have a single player experience with this aircraft? And, and what is it, you know what are we doing to make it a multi a a single player experience and a multi crew cockpit yeah so I, that's a really interesting question and one i struggle a little bit with myself because you know that the the two the two sides of the cockpit while there are some redundancies as far as flight controls etc and both guys left and right seat are both rated aviators and they're pretty much interchangeable um, you kind of, you can't shoot a hellfire from the right seat without the left seater doing some stuff. Hmm. It, it is a co completely in real life cooperative cockpit, hmm. like in order to employ the mission equipment and, and the predominance of the, the weapon systems, you have to have both crew members. So there some compromises have to be made, you know, in terms of gameplay. When you look at something like the KA-50 and it's a single pilot ship, I imagine number one, there's probably, and, and I'm just speculating here as far as real life, but right. they're probably doing less scouting and yeah. less employment of the hunting aspect of looking for targets uh, because you can't fly and avoid obstacles and not hit trees and other aircraft and manage the tactical threat to the helicopter and look for targets. Um, it's just not possible. Yeah. So. I imagine that something like a K-50 or something that's a single pilot aircraft, you know, they go out, they know where the targets are. They're either given the targets or something like that. And then, you know, you go out and shoot them. So it maybe perhaps it's a simpler mission. Yeah. I, I think what we're going to do in the 58 is blend some of those left seat and right seat tasks. Cause you're going to start in the right seat. I know there's a huge amount of interest in, in the multiplayer aspect of DCS. Mm -hmm. Um, and when you look at something like, you know, the F-14, the Wizzo is a, is an integral part. Like you can't employ that aircraft to the extent of its capability without the other crew member. Right. Hopefully, you know, that pans out. Yeah. Uh, I think initially it's going to be single pilot stuff. So there's, there's going to have to be some, I don't know what's the right way to say it, component changes and methodology changes to bring some of the left seat tasks into the right seat where in real life those switches don't even exist in the right seat right yeah i think one fix i saw to that was you know kind of a hot key to bring up a control panel that's that's you know situated on the far left you know like the mms control panel you know i'm just making up a number you hit f3 boom mms control panel pops up you can push whatever button flip whatever switch you need hit hit the button again and it goes away yeah um, but, but yeah, so it, it's certainly not a, an aircraft that you're just going to hop in and, and fly in a mission profile uh, single pilot. So there's there's got to be some work around. So that's that challenge that they definitely got to address. Yeah, you know, if we fly it like we're just going to run and gun with 50 Callan rockets, mm -hmm. that's completely doable with single pilot. Yep. But, um, you know, you're kind of just visually acquiring targets or you accept the compromise of, okay, I'm going to hit the in-game hover hold button yeah. and the AI autopilot will hover for you. Yeah. Um, but you lose some of that situational awareness like, oh, you know, what's behind me? What's to my sides? What yeah. kind of threats are approaching as your head is buried in that site? And that is kind of a true life representation of what it's really like. Like the left seater probably really doesn't have a whole lot of idea of what's going on outside of 50 meters around the aircraft because his head is buried mm -hmm. in many in many cases looking for targets in the site same as in the apache the front seater is really oh yeah i mean he may not know whether he's in 
you know, Kuwait or, yeah. <laughs> or three, three counties over, so to speak, yeah. uh, because his, his eyes are just glued to the, to the tads looking for targets. Yeah, absolutely. Especially at night, if you're a left seater in a Kiowa, you, you probably don't have a good idea what's going on, uh, unless you're constantly, you know, looking around and, and trying to keep up with it. But if you're, you're on that target and you're trying to keep the sight on something, yeah, you're, you're probably lost. You don't know which way north, south, east, and west is at that point. So I think that's probably a good segue to just talk about the Kiowa. I did want to look at this conversation a little bit differently and, and look more at the history of, of the Kiowa. So we'll just kind of go through some, some touch points in history and then yeah. just kind of expand on, you know, what you know or what I know. If you go back to the mid-60s, I think it was 1965, the Army said, hey, we, we need some sort of light helicopter to do reconnaissance. And so you had Bell, you had Hughes. Uh, put up their competition aircraft, and Bell put up the the YOH-4 Alpha, which is a very ugly-looking helicopter. Um, <laughs> right. The ugly yeah. duckling is what is is what people called it during this. Needless to say, it, it wasn't picked. Um, Hughes was picked up, which gives you the OH-6. Which, of course, when everyone peep, you know people hear about the OH-6, they immediately think of little birds and 160th. That this is not the same aircraft. This is just a weird little ball with with a rotor on top but bell <clears> took <throat> that initial aircraft and they went back to the drawing board and they sort of extended the fuselage and, and kind of prettied it up and did some mo minor modifications and and created the bell 206 jet ranger out of that then in uh 67 ish uh the army said hey we're not getting what we paid for basically the the demand was not being met by Hughes. And so the Army said, hey, we need to kind of reopen this this contract, this competition, and, and get something else. So at this point, Bell kind of swoops back in and says, hey, we went back to the drawing board. Here's, here's the Bell 206. We'll call it the OH-58. Yeah, and by that time, the 206 was already a commercial success. Right. In in good Army practice, we basically just took the civilian aircraft, painted it green, and said, here here's an Army helicopter. Um, it could be armed, had uh, many guns. In fact, one of my instructor pilots in flight school, he flew 58s, was telling me about having the mini gun on the side. But it wasn't. That would have been so awesome. Oh, I just, yeah, that would have been. <laughs> um, but it wasn't designed to, to to be a gunship. You know that that was. I, he he made it sound like it was very rare actually to have the mini gun on board. Um, they just flew, you know, with an observer. Probably had a rifle to shoot out the the door and stuff. But they would do the what we know as pink teams, you know, hunter-killer teams, fly out with Cobras, look for targets, Cobras would engage. Numbers I got, approximately 45 were destroyed in Vietnam, which sounds like a lot. I mean, really, in Vietnam, we were losing helicopters like crazy. Yeah, you know? yeah. Uh, I remember, I think it's the book Low Level Hell, and it talks about one particular battle where a guy flying the OH-6s got shot down in the same battle three times in the same place. Yep, few mills. Yeah, yep. and, you know, and... and Going back, get another aircraft, fly back out, get shot down again, go back out. Then things get a, a little hazier as far as dates, but you've got, again, the 58 Alpha, and now we're going to upgrade to the Charlie. And this is kind of where, to me as a you know quasi-historian of, of military aviation, this is where the 58 becomes an interesting story, because it really becomes a test bed for the Army for a lot of things for the next you know, 10, 15 years. So the Charlie model comes online, it's got a reduced IR signature, you know, they've, they've done things to the exhaust, um, larger instrument panel, MVG compatible lighting. Um, and also apparently the 58 Charlie was the first aircraft uh, to be to be equipped with the APR 39. Um, oh, that's new. That's new. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. So, you okay. know. It, it's on the internet, so it can't be wrong. And then, and then that's before we even really get into what we talked about the the AHIP, the Army Helicopter Improvement Program. Which, and you know, so we talk about the APR thirty nine, which was fielded in the seventies, and we're still rocking that piece of equipment today. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I just missed the voice. Something definitely missing from the sixty four is having that robot talk to you. In 1979 is when the Army, you know, the Army is coming out with the M1 tank, the the, the Apache, uh, the Bradley, the Paladin, all these big systems, the modernization of the United States Army. And so there was a sort of conversation, do, do we design from the ground up a, a new reconnaissance helicopter or do we take what we have and kind of adjust it? And so the decision was made that we're going to we're going to take what we have and we're going to we're going to kind of play with it. Um, so they did another competition, Bell Hughes. Uh, you know, they put up their 
their versions of aircraft. Bell won again with now the 406 uh, Ranger, Jet Ranger. Like you said, basically, you know, civilian version that's it's beefed up. It's already a success. So we grab this 406. Um, and we start the Army Helicopter Improvement Program. So there's a few goals that they wanted to come out of this. Um, they test all kinds of crazy things, uh, but they wanted a you know, stabilized sensor system, which, of course, led to the MMS, uh, Mass Mounted Sight. Uh, they looked yep. at it as a 160th, uh, a possible aircraft for the 160th, but by that point, I think they'd already made their decision to go with uh, the, was essentially the MD-500 uh, OH-6 upgrade. Uh, but then we had some other kind of weird stuff that came out. So the OH-58 X-ray, which is the yeah, the stealthy, that's the, <laughs> right? Um, which I had the had the shrouds around the the um, the center rotor system and had the pointy nose, right? Yeah, it had the pointy nose, and I think it had some sort of gold, um, I don't know, filament or something in the canopy. To, to help with reduction of, of signature is what, what I've heard. Okay. I didn't see anything that, that backed that up. I remember hearing that. So I want to say, and you would know, at Bragg, I feel like we had one of those aircraft. I remember there being an aircraft, and maybe it was back when we had two squadrons of battalions there, but there was an aircraft that had that wedged nose. And I don't know if it was still there when you were there. It may have... No, I never saw one of those. I know that uh, 25th, uh, f first of the 25th attack in Hawaii back before they became we reorganized and became all cavalries um, they had all the pointy nose ones okay yeah I, yeah I, so there, there was multiples of them out there I don't know if those were x-rays or those were just a reduced signature prototypes yeah I'm not sure you know exactly where they fell into the the hierarchy of it all but I, I do remember seeing one because I remember asking like well what is up with this thing and, and yeah I was told there was like six or seven of these that had been used you know and of course we're just basically reusing a fuselage and, and you know changing out the guts. OH-58 was actually the first aircraft to test the WISPUS, so the Wire Strike Protection System, which, I mean, has saved countless lives at this point. Um, yeah. In fact, we just watched a video at work the other day about a Apache, I guess, I don't know, a year or two ago in Germany, hit some wires. Yeah, yeah, um, amazing. A crazy video. And something I never really thought about in all these years of hitting wires, the arcing of electricity and that effect. I just, I never really thought about that. Blinding the pilots, uh, affecting, you know, electronics and stuff. But that Wispus apparently cut wire that was bigger than what it was even rated to cut. Um, yeah, I mean, I think those were the, the big ones in Germany. I mean, those things are like an inch thick. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, so the OH was the first one to have the Wispus. And <clears throat> very I, probably one of the more distinctive features of the 58 is the, the Wispus. Let's see, what else? I, I don't know this for a fact, but I'm pretty sure that the OH-58 was also the first Army aircraft to be a glass cockpit aircraft. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's true. And in fact, I was just talking with, uh, with Sven it it may be you know i i haven't verified it but i believe it it might be the first glass cockpit in the world hmm. Interesting so yeah. for you internet denizens out there that's <laughs> probably a worthwhile research project if you want to verify that yeah yeah because i you know i even looked because i was like well maybe maybe i heard that wrong or maybe somebody was just you know and i went and looked at the alpha model apache because like well surely they no nah, that's all gauges and you know they had for the not the tads whatever they call it back in the the alpha model days they have like the little hooded thing that they got to stick their face in but yeah definitely not glass cockpit and i remember when i went to apaches guys were still talking about the moving map as if it was relatively new to the community and i was like we've had this forever like yeah i've had moving maps since i became a kiowa pilot right um um, well, so keep in mind, so out of the AHIP program, so first of all, the requirement was from the artillery community. Hmm. Um, they're the ones that wrote the, the driving documents that, um, so it didn't come from aviation, in other words, it came from the artillery community for a forward spotter. And that's why they had the mass mounted sight with the ability to target, locate targets, et cetera. Um, but, you know, as in many cases, technology is driven by military projects. So I would not be surprised uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, if the requirement for an advanced helicopter drove the development of digital instrumentation and the first glass cockpit. Mm -hmm. I would not be surprised at that. So I'm about to send you a picture 
and I don't know if you've ever seen this before, but I came across this. So I'm sending it in our Discord. Yeah, okay. So I'm looking at a two-blade. Uh, looks like a stripped-down Alpha Charlie. Uh, it's got some instrumentation on the nose. Um, oh, crap. It looks like it's got a 20-millimeter cannon. That is exactly what that is. Underneath the co-pilot seat. Rock on. Yeah, that, that is that is not instrumentation. Those are barrels. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so, that had to have been earth-shattering. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely majestic. So that is... Uh, when we when we start talking about all these things that they tested, this was apparently uh, one of the things they tested. The the JOH fifty eight uh, is what I read, but they they tested this concept of having a twenty millimeter. Uh, so good on you for figuring that one out. But yeah, twenty millimeter multi barrel, probably the same one that was on a Cobra. Yeah, as I as I look it at it now, yep. Um, yep. and they replaced the co pilot seat and throw that in there. Um, strangely enough, the fumes. Uh, we're affecting the pilot, so this was not a, a long-lived experiment. But tell me, you would not want to do exactly that. Just... You know, uh, yeah, it's even centerline, so right. there's not a whole lot of yaw effects, and <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the crap we came up with in the matter of a couple of months back in those days yeah. <laughs> blows my mind, right? Yeah. Um, now it takes ten or fifteen years to even get the authorization to put a new kind of you know, laser on the gun or whatever. Yeah. 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 Um, and looking at that, it had the, uh, that had the rapid deployment gear on it too. That's not the standard gear. Oh, I didn't even notice that. Yeah. So the, the rapid gear, which we are very familiar with being at Bragg, but, uh, uh, most guys did not have, but allowed the aircraft to, to basically squat and be pushed down, attach wheels to it, and then roll that bad boy back up into a C-130. Yeah. Or, I mean, or there's whatever. all kinds of G whiz stuff on that. It's mm. got, it's got a, um, uh, it doesn't have the bubble canopy, so that's that's an uh, an alpha plus hmm. uh, because of the. If you look at the canopy, it's got that um, that split front canopy. Right. And then look at the blade antenna on the nose where the battery compartment is. Hmm. So it's got an extra FM antenna, and it's got um, IR stacks on the exhaust. Yeah. So that's infrared suppression. So this thing is just chock full of technology in those days. Yeah, yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah, I, I can only imagine shooting that gun. I mean, that's like that's like a poor man's A-10 right there. Yeah. You know? <laughs> that's great. Right. Um, but yeah, I was I was hoping that you had not seen that before, so I wanted to surprise you. No, I had no idea. So as a Woj, as a warrant officer junior grade, a W-1, I had to carry around a set of those barrels to every social function oh, gotcha. that I went to. So it's a, it's a set of 20 millimeter barrels. Uh, three barrel Gatlin gun barrel off a of Cobra. They weigh about 80 pounds, huh. and I was responsible for the upkeep and tender loving care of a set of those barrels. And if we ever had a social function and the barrels were not present, uh, woe betide poor W1. <laughs> um, but it was, uh, yeah, so that that was uh, good times back then. Okay, yeah, so. What I kind of read about this one is this was one of these sort of thought processes that, as you said, the, the 58 was really an artillery requirement. They just wanted a helicopter that had these advanced sensors that could look out, identify targets. And then it started to kind of blend into, well, we want it to work with the Apaches too. We want something that can go out and find targets for the Apaches. Um, and then start rolling into Prime Chance. Operation Prime Chance in the in the Persian Gulf was really a, a task force one sixtieth type operation. They were operating off of uh, naval vessels and uh, those mobile platforms that they kind of plopped down in the water. And uh, and I'm not sure what was necessarily driving it, but they wanted to replace all or some of one sixtieth with this task force 118 which was this new 58 delta that had been somewhat weaponized and it was going to take over the role I, I assume to free them up to do other stuff that they were doing yeah that's what i was just going to say that that would be my assumption yeah um so they did do a partial transition is what i'm tracking there was it, it didn't go off completely um so it was sort of a half 
Task Force 118 and then half Task Force 160. They were operating off of ships. You know, at least for me, I could not find a whole lot of factual data. It was just sort of just kind of glazed over. These are some things that happened. Uh, I am tracking a 1 OH uh, did crash in the water, but the, the crew survived. Not tracking any engagements. The stories that I had always kind of grown up with hearing about was that, you know, they were mainly flying around with stingers, which is something that had been tested years before. In fact, with a Charlie model, I think I've, I've got a picture somewhere. Uh, OH 58 Charlie Sierra yeah. model, which was basically they strapped on some stinger. But the idea being in prime chance is that these guys were flying around with stingers on board. And against the water, heat signature of a boat, you know, it's 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 sort of like a hellfire in, in that respect. Um, you've got a guided missile. But, it, but this was sort of the ushering in of the armed Kiowa. A lot of the development that went into arming these aircraft, it was sort of bolt-on technology, but it became the the you know the genesis of of the future Kiowa warrior which is what we eventually came to um of course desert storm happened very soon after prime chance uh numbers i found was you know about 9000 hours flown of of 58 deltas i'm not tracking any of them are armed i think that was still kind of in the process of transitioning so these I were, believe that's right. Yeah. yeah, so these were unarmed aircraft. Um, still, 9,000 hours, nothing to sneeze at. I mean, that was a relatively short war. But, yeah. You know, I, I, as far as what they were actually doing, you know, I, I, nothing that I could come across. One thing that I was interested in, I'm interested to know what, what you know about this, but Mogadishu. Are you tracking anything with 58s in Mogadishu? No. So I was That was 10th Mountain, so it would have been, you know, 317 Cav in those days, but... Yeah, so when we were in Afghanistan in, what was it, 09, I think, um, and I'll edit names, but but Scott was sitting in the headquarters with me, and we were, I don't know, we were both messing with our computers, and, and, I, and I asked him, I said, hey, you know, you've got a 10th Mountain combat patch. I said, was that Iraq or Afghanistan? And he says, it was, no, it was neither, it was, it was Somalia. And and he kind of just kind of gave me the air, like he didn't really want to talk about it. I mean, you know how how he was, he, you know, he was kind of yeah. quiet about things. But I kind of pressed him on it a little bit and, and started pulling it out of him. Um, and sure enough, we had 58 deltas, unarmed 58 deltas, in Somalia as well. Um, and so I said, well, were you there with the whole, you know, Black Hawk Down when that happened? And he's like, oh yeah. Um, and so I was like, well, you know, tell me more. So essentially what he said, you know, and, and I believe him is, uh, he's like that night, like we were all involved. It wasn't a 160th Ranger thing, you know, and that's what everyone sees in the movies and stuff. But he's right. like, he's like, they basically drew a line on the map and said, you know, along this highway. And it said, everything on the right goes to 160th. Everything on the left goes to 10th mountain. And he's like, we were out there lazing targets, sparkling targets. Cobras were blowing stuff up. Like it was game on. Um, and so yeah, I thought, wow, I had no idea. Yeah, I, you know, never so, heard that. So was he, I, I know he goes way back. Like, I think he was a Woj when 4-2, uh, um, so back from Fort Polk, 4-2 hmm. uh, left there when they were second ACR. They had the overwater mission, and they came to Fort Bragg. I think he was part of that. Mm -hmm. um, so when when was Mogadishu? 89? No, that was... 93 93 something okay so i i don't know if i'm pretty sure drum still had cobras then i don't know if they even had 58 so i wonder if it was part of the 42 cav mission i'm not really sure yeah i don't know um but, but he goes back a ways yeah yeah and i don't even remember if he was a pilot or if he was i i just don't remember like i mean this conversation was you know 10 years ago but i was just blown away that like we we had Kai was there. I, I just had no idea. Um, so I thought yeah, you talking. remember Phil, right? Yeah. Um, so he was, they were together in that same unit. So Phil, Phil okay. goes way back. Yeah, yeah, gosh, I haven't thought about him in ages. And then, of course, you know, Bosnia, Kosovo, um, not so much there for the shooting part, but but definitely there for the, the, the peacekeeping and all that stuff. Um, yeah. sure we all know guys that, that flew there for that. So, so during all this that's going on, of course, the Army's also got an eye on on the Comanche. So we've been building the Comanche, we've been working on it for, gosh, a, a decade. I, I think all the 90s, probably a little bit in the 80s, Yep. we're working on the Comanche, the stealth helicopter, uh, which I still can't wrap my head around, a stealth helicopter. <laughs> um, but, um, and, and larger than I thought it would be. I remember seeing one at Rucker when they had it there at the museum, and I was like, man, this thing's a lot bigger than I thought it would be. 
Yeah, I think it was around 14,000 pounds or something. Yeah, I mean, it looked like a great cockpit. It had the cyclic on the side, um, which would have been interesting. But uh, so the Comanche, you know, we're building that up with the view to we're going to replace the 58. In fact, when I got picked, uh, or I should say I picked it because it was my choice, but I picked the 58s in flight school, I think it was early 2004, and I remember being told, like, well, you know, you're going to learn the 58, but you'll probably be back here in, like, two or three years, and you'll and you'll fly the Comanche. Uh, and then about two months later, it was like, oh, we just canceled the Comanche. So yeah. <laughs> you guys will be flying 58 for, for a while. Um, and then really... I was told the same thing. Okay, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 98. I was like, first first Comanches fielded are supposed to be 2,000. Wow. Uh, so... <laughs> a, a, a tradition of excellence. Um, yeah, we know how that turned out. Yeah, so... And then, of course, obviously, September 11th, Global War on Terror, OAF, OEF. And that, you know, to me is where the 58, like, it, it's almost like it all culminated into this, you know, I hate to say perfect storm because obviously it was terrible and lot, lots of bad things happened. But this perfect storm for the Kiowa to operate in an environment that it was, it, it wasn't purpose built for, but it operated almost as if it was. You know, I, I think we brought a lot to the table. In many respects, yeah. Yeah. I, I have some I have some countering views myself. Uh, but yeah, we'll get into it. Okay. Well, so we'll start with OIF in the sense that I think there was a lot of um, pushback. At least that's what I saw. Pushback to sending 58s to Afghanistan based on the altitudes. I, I think we sent them very fair, fairly early on. But they weren't allowed to really do anything. They kind of stayed real close to the airfield. You know, they kind of stayed in the, the valleys and stuff. Yeah, they had to stay down south in the Kandahar AOR mm -hmm. yeah. because some staffer um, had, so this was early on, like you said, uh, had done some half-assed analysis mm -hmm. based on the, the power charts in the Dash 10 and said, oh, these things can't operate above whatever it was, 8,000 feet or I don't remember the exact numbers, but um, that became like the truth in quotes. Yeah. 58s can't operate in the mountains. 58s right. can't do this. 58s can't do that. And that became the army stance for, I don't know what, three, four, five years after that. Yeah. Um, and it simply wasn't true. Yeah. So through, yeah, I'm sure you'll, you'll get into those, those, you know, subsequent years in a minute, but um, absolutely. I mean, you know, you, you and I flew around at 10, 12,000 feet, mm -hmm. not daily, but it wasn't unusual. Yeah, you, so. you had to just change the way you did things. Um, exactly, but but the the sort of uh, misplaced <laughs> conception that the 58s couldn't operate at certain altitudes or locations in Afghanistan proved unfounded, and it, and it you know it's kind of indicative of this. Um, this this map this color coded map comes out and is published and says this is the truth and everybody just assumed well okay and that became the planning guidance for top level staff for several years afterwards when it really wasn't founded in any sort of yeah. uh, technical truth yeah so Iraq became sort of the focus for the 58s and you know I, I guess you know looking at Pat's charts it was probably a matter of more Apaches can go to Afghanistan. Now we're going to send Kiowas to Iraq. Much more closer to sea level. Much more capable. Again, based off power, you know, performance planning charts and things of that nature. Um, so when I say I think the Kiowa was, you know, not purpose built, but but operate effectively. When you look at a Kiowa, you know, one of my first concerns when I saw the 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 module for DCS and I said, Wow, this is awesome! I'm so excited. My next thought was, I think people are going to be somewhat disappointed because they're only going to carry a couple rockets and you know in a missile you know yeah <laughs> um right. and if you're a guy who's been playing you know flying a10s or flying harriers or something you're like well, well this is crap you know <laughs> um yeah but in this type of environment you didn't need a lot you know i mean it was there was a few times where you wanted some more but generally speaking you landed with the same amount of ammo you took off with generally speaking yeah yeah other I mean, times we had to land every 15 minutes right. if we went to chester <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. But I think going back to instead of looking at it from an aircraft perspective, but a community perspective, this was a group of guys who had who had grown up, been trained, developed to to talk smart on the radio, right? To make good decisions, to to paint the picture for the ground force, you know, doing reconnaissance, 
pulling security for for large formations it 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 translated to to this environment where you spend a lot of your time almost being like a traffic copter you know i mean yeah. i don't know how many times i you know i'm calling a guy on the ground like hey you know you should have taken a left back there you know um and then yeah, of course they I've turn around several and, of, those. Yeah. of course they turn around and take a left and you're like no 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 it's it's a right to you now you know <laughs> and they're 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 even more <laughs> lost but you know whatever yeah um but that's what I get out of it is I think that where the 58 kind of shined is our ability to, to, to get low enough to do those things to be effective and, and to still have the firepower to, to at least get guys out of trouble when it got to that point. Yeah. Um, so it, I, I've developed a, a couple of thoughts over the years. Um, okay. Number one, like our, our systems, even then, were already antiquated, right? The oh, site, yeah. Oh, yeah. which was cutting edge technology when it was fielded in the late 80s um you you know as you went through the history you mentioned hey there's comanche is coming down the line and so the army always looked at the 58 as an interim right it never okay. got it, it never got the budgetary support for modernization and upgrades that a full-fledged um program of record is what we call it would have gotten because the army was always had an eye turned towards well we're fielding comanche in two years mm -hmm. well it it's it's like what pc tells uh <laughs> tells the community is like the module will be ready in two weeks right <laughs> um, and uh and it's always two weeks forever yeah. um and that's what comanche ended up being so nevertheless the army always looked at it like we don't want to spend any money on kw because it's just it's just a stopgap between yeah now and when Comanche is finally going to hit the street. Well, Comanche never materialized. So KW suffered in modernization, whereas like the Apache got the modernized TADs and, you know, all kinds of upgrades over, over oh, the, yeah. the years. We never did because the budget wasn't behind it. So that yeah. forced us to operate a certain way. Yeah. Um, the site certainly was not designed for the type of flying and fighting that we did in the counterinsurgency environment, right? Yeah. It was designed, um, and the software behind it was designed to hover at a, in a hover hole uh, in a static location at 50 feet and scan the battlefield from, you know, basically from West Germany to find the Soviet tanks as they were crossing the folded gap into mm -hmm. the European invasion. And it would have been really good at that. Yeah. Uh, but it's not so great when you're never slowing down below 60 knots, yeah. trying to find one guy uh, that literally is maybe two or 300 meters away from you. So the way we flew and the way we fought was not really using, like you said, not using the helicopter the way it was designed or intended. Um, and we learned to do things otherwise, mm -hmm. which was talk to the ground force, um, commu over communicate, mm -hmm. tell them what we were seeing. And because we didn't have a system that could find, you know, the, the freckles on a fly at five miles, <laughs> we had to get down below 300 feet and literally stick our nose in it. And, um, in, in a lot of cases, you know, blow aside the weeds with our rotor wash so that we could see what was underneath the weeds. Yeah. Um, and that, that put us in a certain flight regime that made us, uh, you know, kind of obviously speaking, if you're that, if you're that 11 Bravo infantryman slogging along on a, on a patrol route and you look up and you see a KW that's, you know, just above your head, hmm. there's a certain comfort there because you can hear them. You can see them. Um, they're buzzing around you all the time. You can hear their voices on the radio. And I think that's where we built our reputation and that's how our guys grew up yeah. in feeling like part of that knife fight, so to speak. Yeah. Was it the way that the KW was intended to fight? Absolutely not. Yeah. And had we had better electronics and systems, I believe that we wouldn't have fought that way. Uh, I agree um, 100%. Um, when, I was, when I left Bragg and was teaching at, at Fort Benning, um, I, every every single class, you know, when, when guys found out that I flew Kiowas, they was, oh, we loved you guys. We loved you guys. And they would inevitably kind of start talking about, well, you know, the Apaches were always so far away. And I and I would always correct them. i say, look, they were far away because they could be, because they could see just fine from where they were. 
I said, the exactly. only reason I was close to you is because I couldn't see anything, <laughs> you know? And it's like, if I didn't have to get that close, I probably wouldn't either, you know? And it's like, here, look at the scars on my arm. This is what happens when you get too close. Everyone and, can see the helicopter. Now I can't see everyone on the ground. So I'm flying over and, bad guys and, all the time. You know, compound that with the fact that you're flying a single engine helicopter yeah. that was not purpose built to, you know, had no redundant hydraulics, had no redundant yeah. um, flight control systems all of which the Apache and the Blackhawk and modern helicopters had. Yeah. Like those things can take a beating and still keep going. The Kiowa Warrior literally is made out of beer can aluminum. Yeah. <laughs> and there's not a lot to stop a bullet going through it as, you know, as you know and as I know. So, yeah. Um so sticking sticking your nose out or sticking your ass in the line of fire was necessary, but in many cases like had I had a different opportunity to employ a high tech electronic site from 15 miles away yeah. i probably would have done that oh absolutely um, and i think that that's interestingly enough why i found my experience in afghanistan actually like like the 58 could operate there as we just said you know from altitudes it didn't matter but i could actually use the site like i used the site in afghanistan you know yeah because i was forced to fly higher because of the terrain um, and I knew I didn't have the margins that I needed to fly low and fly like, you know, like a crazy man. So I'm going to fly at altitude. Well, now I am going to use the site. And now I could find these opportunities to actually use the aircraft almost like it was purpose built intended to do. Um, albeit still at a, at a speed, like you said, no one's hovering around in Afghanistan. Um, but yeah, it, yeah. It, it worked there fine, you know? And so here's the dichotomy of the, of the KW, so to speak, like, you know, we field a lot of questions like, will there be Link 16? Will there be man-to-man -man teaming? Will there be... Yeah. So, we, you know, we started off this conversation saying that the Kiowa Warrior was the first glass cockpit, was the first one to field WISPIS, was a test bed for many, many systems that are now commonplace. Mm. It was cutting edge at the time and was the, was the you know, first foray into a lot of high-tech systems that we now take for granted. Yeah. But the way we fought it and flew it, did like the you know i'll talk about digital comms a little bit they're there uh i started my career to, uh you know learning how to use aths the airborne target handover yeah. system <laughs> which was intended to send digital digital fire requests and missions between artillery and the oh58 and so the the big you know star wars pie in the sky idea was kai warrior's gonna find a target it'll target located it'll be a digital grid in its system you can hit a button it'll digitally send that that fire mission to the firing battery and it'll get it they will already have all the data they need to to shoot the mission and they just hit another button and boom the rounds are on the way yeah well again due to budgets that never materialized and congressional interest changes and so many things happen over the course of 10 or 15 years that these these things never pan out. BFT, we had man to man teaming, but the way we used the Kiowa was truly, we, we jumped all the way back to 1967. Yeah. Right? Except we had a site. Um, yeah. So we flew and fought that thing like it was Vietnam. Yeah, um, I mean, in Afghanistan, we, you know, where I was at, we did the the pink team with the, with the 64s. And I remember... And I remember kind of pushing back against it because, you know, it's like people want to point at Vietnam and say, well, this is what we did with, you know, COVID and stuff. I said, yeah, but these are not the same aircraft. Like they're, yeah. they're not operating the same way. And, you know, the Apache a little bit harder, you know, I can say this now from experience, a little bit harder to look down. Um, and, the, and they were constantly losing us to the point that we were literally spray painting lines and stuff on the top of our blades so they could have something to see, you know. Um, but you're absolutely right. We kind of went back to this old style of, of fighting, um, and a lot of the technology we had, we we didn't use. Um, and if we'd have had some other stuff, I mean, God, I, I would have given anything for a laser spot tracker. Exactly. Um, so, or the ability yeah, to turn my head and, and, and move the, the MMS, you know? <laughs> that's, that's where I was going with this is, I imagine that in some ways the DCS player will be surprised at what isn't available in the KW. Yeah. Because with modern equipment, you learn to expect so many things. And 
like you said, a spot tracker seems like a very, very basic piece of kit, right? Mm. But again, due to budgets, we never got one. Yeah. So what you what you resort to is everything is voice. And oh, by the way, combat tends to um, gel everything down to the least common denominator and oversimplify things. So yeah. when you have these super sophisticated systems that break occasionally, yeah. well, you don't use them. And everything goes back to you're sending voice spot reports, you're sending voice calls for fire, you're talking to the, your, your wingman, everything over voice. Yeah. Um, the GWIS systems are kind of cool, but a lot of cases in my experience, they end up being kludgy and counterintuitive and they don't work in the heat of the moment. Yeah. And so you always end up devolving. And I think the Apaches do this as well. And I don't know, maybe tigers, et cetera. Um, I would venture to say that nobody has as much real time combat experience as U S army aviators nowadays, mm-hmm. um, where they've got to flesh out their techniques and, and procedures. But where, where we had the computer in the, in the helicopter, for instance, we could send a digital message, but it just never got used because either the artillery guys weren't prepared to receive it or, you know, there's just so many yeah. stumbling blocks in the way to actually make the digital systems work that you always go, oh, screw it. Let's just do it voice. Yeah. And that's ten, that tends to be what it, what it devolved down to. I can think on, you know, count on one hand how many times I used BFT in combat, you know, to actually send a message to someone or, you know, generally yeah. you just look for blue marks on the map and say, oh, there's good guys there, you know. And and believe me, I was that guy, like I was, I was the nerd, I was the SP that was insisting, um, sure. like, hey guys, you know, like, we're not just going to do this once every year during your A part, like, send me a digital spot report. And I would show them in the course of a mission, we'd be flying up and down the Kunar or something. And I would, you know, target locate something and I would send them a digital spot report and I, you know, I'd be trail or something hmm. and I would send it to lead. And the, the guy up in left seat lead would call back and say, Hey, did you just send me a digital spot report? <laughs> yeah, man. Shit. I've never seen one of those before. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it worked when you used it, like it would populate on your screen. You would get a bunch of information. You could pre-point it right away. Like if you knew how yeah. to use it, it worked pretty elegantly, but, um, due to cultural, you know, there's a whole slew of reasons why it didn't get used. So to tie this all back to what we started talking about is I think the DCS player may be surprised. Like if we were to do things, the if we were to model everything the way we actually used it, hmm. you are you are not talking to that F-16 via a digital link. Right. Didn't happen. Nope. Um, and and same thing with fires, et cetera. So, uh, yeah. So you know, some some things I imagine we're going to put in the game that that are sort of a step beyond what actually happened in real life. Yeah, you, you're kind of exploring the what if. You know, you, you had some of these capabilities, especially in the later years. You know, after I left Bragg, I, I know there were some some additions to the aircraft that I just I never experienced, like the um, CMOS you know, being installed. Yeah. And I think there was some other man done man type equipment, you know, the mum T and everything. You know, I, I never yep. got to play with any of that until I got in the 64s. But yeah, I think you're right. I think the average player is probably going to expect something or they'll even read about it and then they'll get in and they're like, well, wait a minute, what, this doesn't really apply, you know, and maybe they come to the same yeah. conclusion. Like, well, I have this capability, but I don't really use it. I mean, even some of the aircraft in DCS that I fly, like I know it can do something, but I don't, I don't use it, you know? Yeah, I mean, we, we kind of beat it to death, but th- the way the aircraft was used for the last, gosh, 15 years was not the way it was intended. Yeah. But nevertheless, it it was, in fact, the most reliable platform out there. It was the most requested. You know, this is anecdotal. I don't have proof of that, but right. um, I, I believe the OR rates speak for, for themselves. So, uh, And then you tie it together with, you kind of let off the this round of, of discussion with like the way our pilots operated and thought and interacted with the guys that they supported. Mm -hmm. It it was cultural. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that's what led Polychop into kind of picking the KW is because 
they they were somewhat enamored of you know the lore and the history and yeah. and what they hear of the stories it's kind of a i guess back and forth like the helicopter drove the way we did things but we did things because um that got the mission done yeah so yeah it's it it was an it's an interesting time and an interesting aircraft yeah super fun to fly too oh yeah blast so yeah i looked for some numbers um bell published and this was all the way back in 2012 that the oh58 had flown two million flight hours and 750,000 of, uh, of those had been in combat. And this was 2012. I, I couldn't find yeah. anything more recent. I know it's there. I, I just couldn't find it. I read something that it was. It ended up with 830,000 combat hours. Wow. Yeah. It, you know, th that's not just OIF, OEF. That's, that's everything. Yeah. But still, a preponderance of that is, is definitely going to come from OIF uh, and OEF. Um, so then we kind of get to the twilight, right? So the, the as you mentioned, the um, ARI. ARI. Yeah, I couldn't think of it. Uh, where we decided, and there's some math behind it, right? I mean, it, we were all emotional about it. I think some more than others, but, you know, nobody wanted to see this era end. Um, but I know I've talked to people who were on the other side of it, you know, said, look, it's, it's a numbers game. You know, in order to, just as you brought up, the aircraft needed upgrades desperately um to make it to make it competitive in the modern environment and it was just going to cost an exorbitant amount of money to do that and so the decision was made to divest the 58s and essentially replace that task with h64s and uh, unmanned platforms and then what i'm seeing and I, I well you probably weren't there anymore but 117 was the last deployment um yeah, I was already gone by that time. Yeah, so so 117 out of Fort Bragg, which is the unit that you and I both served in, uh, deployed to Korea in 2016, and that was the last OH-58 deployment. They came back, and they're they're currently in the process of fielding uh, H-64s, Echoes. But that wasn't really the end of the story, because now what we've done is we've sold some of these to Croatia and Tunisia. Um, in fact, one just crashed, I think, recently. Yeah, I think it was in January. Yeah, um, and I I believe both pilots died. Uh, unfortunately, they they went into yeah, the water. Yeah, it was over water, I think. Yeah, um, but interestingly enough, like YouTube keeps popping up with these videos of of Croatian OH 58s like you know they're at parades and stuff, and people are fawning all over them, watching them start up and take off, and it's kind of interesting to watch. But yeah, um, but yeah, Warms so the in my that's, heart. that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um. But yeah, so I, I I wanted to have this discussion because I think there is somewhat of a rich history there that the average person just doesn't know about. I mean, I remember telling people, you know, well, what do you do? Oh, I'm a pilot in the Army. Oh, what do you fly? Oh, I fly Kylos. Well, Crickets. Yeah, and they're like, which one is that? You know, right. And the answer was always, well, we're the ones with the balls. You tell them about the MMS. Um, and in fact, when I was in Bravo 182, before it became a, a, a 64 unit, we, we actually had our patches made. And it had, uh, it had that and said, you know, we're the ones with the balls and, and had pointed to the MMS. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, nobody, nobody knew what that was. You know, you tell them Black Hawk Apache, of course, they know what those are. But if you look back at this history, you can see like, well, heck, this, there's a lot of Army aviation history balled up in this little, this little aircraft that was, you know, too light to fight and too slow to run. Exactly. Wow. And I think um, the, the best, the, the best legacy that we can claim is that, you know, when I taught at the schoolhouse at Fort Rucker, uh, most of the guys that were coming through new pilots wise mm. were former infantrymen. Mm. And so that tells you a lot. Like if the, if the infantrymen that just got out of a, you know, their first or second or third deployment and put in their warrant flight packet and went warrant and they choose to go KW, that kind of you know the underlying message there is that there there is something that they see in you know the way it operated or the way the guys operated it um that they gravitated towards that because they knew it was always in the mix i hope you enjoyed the video we've got some plans to expand this conversation so like and subscribe to stay with us and for more information about the DCS Kiowa module, check out Berendis' videos linked in the description below. Take care.